Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I am joined by my good friend, Carl Scott, to talk about rock music, about the movies, about Almost Famous, Cameron Crowe's greatest achievement in the art, about really his own life. Emerson famously told us that each one of us has one great story to tell if we but attend to our experiences. Being sincere or authentic about what we have been through and what we have learned could make for great storytelling, and Cameron Crowe, a very successful director of course, certainly proved it in this one case, which seems to a large extent to be autobiographical, not without critical distance, not without a certain sentimentality and even schmaltz now and then, and certainly not without many, many insights into the 60s and 70s the coming of a whole new kind of freedom through popular music for Americans, and especially, of course, for young Americans. Carl, you were not just a college professor, you work in the Constitutional Center at Provo, you've got all sorts of publications behind you, but you also have a dark side among conservative intellectuals as a fan of rock music who writes very appreciatively and astutely about rock music, and in fact have upwards of 100 essays in your songbook. You're the guy for me for this movie. I learned to think about Cameron Crowe reading your essays in your songbook about Almost Famous. And so it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast and to do this together. Well, thank you, Titus. Yeah, the series of essays is called Carl's Rock Songbook, and we'll maybe have a chance to talk about that a little bit more towards the end of the podcast. But yeah, Almost Famous was a movie, you know, came out in 2000, and it definitely grew on me as I wrote about it. I considered it initially in a list of 10 best movies for thinking about popular music, and Almost Famous was near the top. In retrospect, I think it might be our best movie so far on rock music, the rock music phenomenon. Now, as a writer on popular music, I have all kinds of distinctions. For example, I think there's a core distinction between rock and roll, a kind of earlier good time dance music, and rock music, which has various styles, but hard rock is maybe the most important and the one that is most focused on in this film. I think this film's going to have a long life. I've encountered people who maybe aren't very interested in rock music, but they'll tell me, I just love this film. I keep returning to it. So we're going to talk about that feature of the sentimentality of it that's, I think, authentic on one hand. There's some problems with it on the other, but I think it might go down as a kind of, it's a wonderful life or copra type film for future generations to help them think about what they love about popular music. As our friend uh, Peter Lawler used to say, it's a nifty piece of work of selective nostalgia. It is yeah. nostalgic about the past, about what was right. going on two generations back, but it's also intelligent. It's not blind or adoring, and it rewards attention, and it's really fun to watch, even a second or a third time. It had a strange fate. Cameron Crowe, who wrote, directed, and produced the movie as well, along with people who helped write music for it, and all sorts of talent involved on all sides of the movie production. Besides all this, he also had the support of people who were invested in this new America of the 60s and later. From the beginning, Spielberg encouraged him, after he read the script, to film every word of it. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's a very long movie, almost three hours. He kind of did that. But after he made the movie, he flew it to London to screen it for Robert Plant and Jimmy Page. And that's why there are Led Zeppelin songs in the movie. They gave their approval to have this done, which was very, very rare. That, again, is a testimony that this movie gets at certain important truths, some of them pleasant and some of them not, about what really happened. And nevertheless, this blockbuster budget or nearly high-budget movie, more than $60 million, with a large multi-million mm -hmm. dollar music budget, flopped. America did not care for this in 2000. It barely made $30 million, nowhere near making its money back, much less being a hit. But at the same time, as you say, it has staying power. It was intended to be a blockbuster, but it came called it instead and found newer and newer audiences and shows a certain discernment that goes beyond popularity. It's a strange thing to see a movie about popularity and popular music that itself was not at all popular, but is instead quite true to the phenomenon it describes in a careful and fairly loving manner. 
So maybe we should start with the overview of the plot and talk about the various episodes that reveal rock music, the fans, the band, the press, and its consequences. Right. So we follow the story of William Miller, played by Pat Fugit. And he is very young, and he's been pushed forward in grades by his mother. So he's kind of precocious in many ways. And, and one of the things he falls into is rock music and reading the best criticism about it. At the time, that was a writer for Cream magazine, Lester Bangs. He's mentored by Lester Bangs, and that leads to his connection with a band called Stillwater. Now, Stillwater, there's a name that's obviously significant. This is a film that is set in the rock scene prior to punk, prior to that bohemian stance, that democratization of fame stance that punk and new wave with it put into the overall rock culture. It's also, I would say, pre-ironic and pre-feminist. Rock later on always feels a need to be ironic and to at least tip the hat to some feminist truths. One of the special things about Almost Famous is that Crow is able to capture a kind of innocence in decadence. These people loved the sex, the chicks, the drugs, the rock and roll. And they wore it on their sleep. There was no irony in their loving the fame and everything that went with it. I guess it's just Crow being true to his, what he saw and what he experienced. The basic plot is this young, aspiring rock writer starts traveling with this band, Stillwater, as they go from city to city. And as they move forward, the relationships between he and the band, as well as he and the groupies who are with the band, the most important of which is Penny Lane, played by Kate Hudson. Those relationships develop, get more complicated. We see the band go through some ups and downs. And eventually some very ugly stuff emerges about the band. Some of the relationships between the members really go sour. There's a love affair between Penny Lane and the lead guitarist Russell, played by Billy Crudup. And it turns out really badly. There's an important line by the Lester Bangs character, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, really a great performance, where Lester Bangs says, well, you're falling into this confusion. It's the sex as love or love as sex confusion. And we see that in a number of ways play out. Our young hero, Billy Miller, sort of loves Kate Hudson in a way, Penny Lane. But the big one is that Penny Lane falls for Russell, even though she presents herself as, well, I'm a groupie, I kind of give you sexual favors, it's all for the sake of the music, but falls in love with him, and he can't reciprocate, and that's sort of the tragedy at the heart of the film. And then the film has finally some resolutions of all of this stuff, and it's kind of a coming-of-age story for William Miller. We get a glimpse into early rock writing, he works for Rolling Stone. And overall, we get a glimpse of early 70s monster tour rock life. Led Zeppelin and David Bowie are very much in the background as kind of the aesthetic markers of excellence. And again, Stillwater is aspiring on the cups of fame. Their name itself indicates a certain level of mediocrity. But the drama is showing us in various ways that there's some level of specialness, particularly in Russell's guitar playing. At the core of the movie, there seems to be this relationship between four people. The young writer, Pat Fugit, mm -hmm. this writer he idolizes, who is a model for him, the famous Lester Bangs, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, the band leader, who seems to be one of America's emerging rock gods, played by Billy Crudup, and then this young woman, beautiful, incredibly self-possessed and seemingly in control of her destiny, played by Kate Hudson. She lives under a pseudonym, Penny Lane, and she is the center of the movie so far as the beautiful is concerned. From the movie poster, which is her all-American, tanned, blonde, beautiful hair, beautiful smile picture, with sunglasses she's in a certain way unavailable to us. You don't know what's going on inside her, but she's dazzling to see. It's a remarkable performance, and the image of love in the movie, strangely enough, is this young woman. Fame is young men, and beyond the fame that 
Stillwater can achieve. There are these other characters, Led Zeppelin, as you said, David Bowie. Bob Dylan makes an appearance at some point as a sort of kingmaker. If he bestows an hour of his attention on your band at the party, that raises you in popular expectation, in your own expectations. These giants who seem to walk above their fans, and whenever they manifest among them cause enthusiasm, fervor, madness, all of this stuff is only dimly reflected in the success the band achieves, but it is at the same time very, very urgent. So the band might be broken up, actually, by the prospect of success itself, by the self-conscious understanding of its leader, Billy Crudup, as an emerging rock god. He is a front man, and the other guys are just there. And that seems mm-hmm. to break up any possibility of cooperation, if taken too seriously, because it means that only he is free. Only he has leaped into the stratosphere of American fantasies, whereas they have to stay behind in their workaday lives. Sure, they get a lot of perks and they live very unusual lives as rock bands on the road, but this may all go away for them. It's not the case that all the bands stayed together through greatness, and of course band conflicts have ruined maybe most of the rock acts that attained any fame. So, while the beautiful is concentrated in this woman, fame is a different sort of thing. And the difference would seem to be this. Like the demigods Bowie and Led Zeppelin, even this small-time famous band, they seem to be important people. They're fit really for tragic poetry. They're impressive, but they're not really good people. But they're not really wicked people either. And so Mm -hmm. our interest in their fate, are they going to turn, as Aristotle tells us, from good fortune to bad fortune, through some mistake that they make? This is supposed to be a certain reflection on society. Americans have whole new expectations, and you get this view of them through writers. Writers are supposed to be, to some extent, truth-tellers in America, but also they might be power worshippers. They might pander to the audience, and all of these things are explored through rock writing. You have the man who is too old to believe in rock anymore, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, who was sick the few days he was there for shooting, and who gives a particularly visceral performance for that reason. You get a sense of how morose and how angry and passionate he is about the death of rock music as he sees it. And then you have this too young to be cynical guy, who really believes that telling the truth about rock music is telling how great it is. So he's excited about any opportunity to say it. He doesn't just want to be a success as a writer. He wants to give people the good news. He's an aspiring evangelist at a certain level. What he wants to tell people is what he's so excited about, from Black Sabbath to the band he ends up following around, Stillwater to really anything else. This young man has to grow up, and it's worth finding out what is he going to grow up as. He has these two models. One of them is Lester Bangs, the rock critic who is a counterculture within the counterculture. He has soured up on rock music because it has gone commercial, corporate, soulless. And on the other hand, of course, there is Rolling Stone magazine, which the writer, as much as this up-and-coming band, call The Enemy. They are the instrument of deification in popular culture, and for that reason they are both to be loved and to be hated. Their influence is awesome, and the temptation they hold out that you will tell the truth, you will reveal to America what great beauty and great new authenticity is possible now. But on the other hand, they're deeply corrupt, they are cynical, they are feeding people stories that are likely to sell, They're trying to get in on the action and profit for themselves from people's dreams, from people's aspiration to get some great idea, some great thing that will make them happier, better people through rock music. Right. I would say that, you know, Rolling Stone, Cream, and then also, you know, William Miller and Lester Bangs, these are all people who are convinced. And the early 70s is a very plausible time to be convinced of this that rock music is where it's at. This is the thing that's happening that's most culturally important. If we're to shift back a few years to the 65 to 68 period and think about the accomplishments of people like Dylan, the Beatles, or maybe some lesser knowns like the Zombies or what have you, yeah, there's some leap forwards that are made. 
certain recipes could be made at that time for the first time that couldn't be done before. So the expectation is some people came out of the late 60s and 70s that, you know, rock music was going to be this thing that kept progressing to new higher levels of adult and culture changing meaning turned out to be false. My view is that by some time in the late 80s or early 90s, a lot of the basic formulas had been done. You were coming up against certain bottom line artistic limits. But Almost Famous is set in a period where there still seems to be the expectation that rock could really matter. And that actually is key to the Lester Bangs character. He's a harsh critic of sold out rock. Why is he so harsh? It's because he has such strong belief in rock as some kind of freeing force, some kind of necessary revolution that happened. And he's worried that it's no longer going to be that. And his super high expectations for rock, from a rock critic perspective like my own, will lead to punk. We see him adulate Iggy Pop and this recourse to shock and this recourse to an aesthetic of ugliness at times primitivism, all of those things are going to be celebrated by punk and certain elements of the new wave. But in a way, they don't really solve the underlying problems. So that's the situation that you're in in this movie. And what Crow is so good at is showing you how different people are aspiring to be part of this rock world and the rock fame that goes with it. Also, maybe a feeling that something significant is happening. You mentioned Bob Dylan. He's not really in the movie. There's just a point where they mention, oh, you missed it. We were talking with Bob Dylan for an hour. To me, that's symbolic of, you know, we are in the happening place. We were talking with the poet of our generation, and we might be the new ones. So that's what someone who's smart, intellectual, like Lester Bangs or William Miller sort of wants from rock. But what Crow shows us is that in a way, they're not so unlike the groupies. The groupies are not just everyday sluts. They're not motivated by poverty. They could easily go home. Most of them are we're led to believe from suburban middle-class American backgrounds. Why are they sleeping with the band, etc., and so forth? But the movie argues that their motivation is out of love for the music itself, and Penny Lane actually articulates a kind of program for being band-aids, for making these bands better. So just like the rock critics, by being harsh, will force the music to get better, these band-aids, by being loving, but in a selective way, will make the bands get better. Um, but again, both the rock critic and the groupie, their very activity and their participation in fame is dependent upon these rockers doing what they do. Crow is very good at displaying that dynamic, and that connects to the dynamics between the rock bands and their fans. The bands, there's one point where Stillwater is in Topeka, Kansas, and because of a falling out over some petty issue, just general jealousy between the members of the band, the Russell character, the lead guitarist, is angry. He wants to just get away from it all. He keeps saying, I want something real. By the way, one thing that you learn from Cameron Crowe's director's cut commentary is that there actually was a scene that was supposed to be in his big version of the movie where right before that, Russell encountered his father and his father was with a younger woman, like a rock star with a groupie. He was almost seeing that the rock star example is being followed by everyone, even his elders, who you might expect to resist that example. In any case, that's a moment where Russell is sort of, I'm sick of the whole rock scene, I'm sick of the fictions, the lies, and he goes to this, they, they just happen to meet these Topeka teenagers, they're like, hey, you're from Stillwater, come to our party. And we're forced to see, I think, that Stillwater's fame is dependent upon these ordinary Topeka middle-class people paying for their records, going to their shows. And Stillwater, everyone on the tour is, in Russell's words, this is the circus for them, and they're trying to keep on the road. They're trying to keep from having to go home, back to that middle-class normality. Crow shows us the tensions between that. I think we also see it in the Penny Lane character. We learn at the end of the movie that her real name, absurdly enough, is Lady. So her parents seem to have a hope that she was a natural aristocrat. She becomes this artificial aristocrat this top groupie and she acts in a very haughty way 
costume design is excellent. She's got this Gawa like coat that she wears a lot. She kind of looks like royalty. And she plays that role to the hilt. But her name, Penny Lane, refers to a Beatles song that is nostalgic about ordinary suburbia. So she's somehow aware of where she's really from and that maybe she can't get past that. There's various symbolic ways in which Crow's cinema forces us to see that the rock dream, the rock escape, is parasitic upon this suburban normality, this acceptance of limits, where you sometimes go in your room and play your rock records and escape it all, but bottom line is reality is going to cut in again. That's very well put, and it's perhaps the best thing about Crow's movie that he keeps rock music real by relating it to American society. What makes rock music rock, I think, is the attempt to give meaning to young people and their freedom. It's supposed mm -hmm. to give you an identity when there maybe aren't other things to give you an identity. The movie is especially obvious about this today because if you look at the young people today, they do not get their identities from popular music. Right. And the rock music has been for decades in an essentially nostalgic mood. Mm -hmm. Both affirmations mm -hmm. and revolts are essentially nostalgic. Titus, where do you see young people today getting their identity from instead? Superhero movies, computer games, mm -hmm. and corporations. They're far more organized and far more insistent on a combination of membership and access. And that offers such a good comparison. You see in the movie again and again something very important about why must rock music fail? Because nobody can really tell you what it's supposed to do. Rock music is not its own program. Rock music cannot create a program that will work. If Lester Bangs knows more about the truth about it, the industry is doomed because nobody listens to this guy. He is not the leader of a reform. He is a loyal opposition, agonized both by his loyalty and by the necessity of his opposition, but doomed to fail. If Rolling Stone is the truth about rock music, that's where you get what's really happening, then it's really success worship. Right. And it's if an the interesting... band tells you the truth, then it's the experience. You had to have been there. Now, the problem yes. with that is, persuasive as it is, you see it again and again in the movie. People have this experience. They are moved in their souls by rock music. They move to the beat, they follow the melodies, the guitar speaks to them and works out their fantasies. Now, only Penny Lane and a few people like her pay attention to the lyrics. They care even about the songs that aren't famous. Mm. But they're a small minority. Everybody rides the music. And in that music, they get some vague sense of a revelation, some change that's coming that's going to be great. But nobody can really spell it out, partly because it's not really that intellectual or that deep. But there's another reason, too. You had to have been there. It's an experience that nobody has anymore. And experience has no future tense. It does not establish a program and it does not have any way to make the future predictable. One thing I would say is it's true that the current generations don't really take to rock music or derive their identity from that or other similar forms of popular music. Nonetheless, we now have rock. It's an aesthetic genre that you can utilize. You can do it well, you can do it poorly. It's there for you if you want. The key thing, though, about Almost Famous is that, again, it's at this moment where enough people are still convinced that it might turn out to be something amazing, something incredible. So something that has a cultural impact and poetic import. I mean, I think the example of Bob Dylan is really key here. Somehow bringing high poetic art into forms that are popular, bringing art into people's own lives saying significant things. That was the model in many ways. And in the early 70s, it looked like it could continue. It's in trouble. So there's sort of this punk rock rescue mission that's undertaken. I guess by the 90s, you can see that doesn't really, I mean, it's done some things, but it hasn't really solved the fundamental problems or shown us that rock has really got a progressive arc or is all that important. I would just say just because something isn't proven to be incredibly important doesn't mean that it still doesn't have some worth. I mean, I think it's useful to compare Almost Famous to the movie The Doors. Um, I'm not an Oliver Stone fan, but Stone got it right with The Doors, capturing the Dionysian madness at the heart of the 60s that so many people were ready to surrender themselves to. 
band like The Doors or a person like Jim Morrison could make it a plausible spiritual poetic quest to break on through to the other side. By the time we get to the early 70s in Stillwater, no one has that kind of expectation for these kind of Dionysian revels or for LSD. It's one drug among others. And the sex is shown to be most enjoyed by the top rock bands. No one's pretending to say that, well, sexual revolution is going to just make everything better. It's obviously, it's kind of a competition. It's kind of a manipulation that's going on. And some people, such as these top rock bands, are just going to enjoy the sexual revolution a lot more than others are. So you're right, rock is not going to have a huge future. And we can see that now, 2018. But it's something significant that was created. And at the time, that significance seemed much greater. Yeah, and I think that it reveals something important about Americans and American character. Rock music in a way that is not available to us now reveals that the heart of freedom is savage. All these kids who come out, as you put it, Cameron shows very clearly, these are middle class, vaguely suburban kids born into the first prosperity in America in quite some time. And America mm -hmm. isn't prepared to realize what they're going to do and, or who they are because right. Americans live in the nostalgia for the culture of the previous generation. And we see with our protagonist's mother, played by Frances McDormand, in a very good, very moving role. She's liberal, enlightenment revolutionary, college professor, and at the same time, a very protective, possessive, old school American mother. Like all American parents, she wants the best for her kids, and that includes a lot of freedom for them. But also, she has all these social conservative views that would today seem oligarchic. You rule over your kids' lives, you insist on their education as the path to success, and so forth, which of course also were far more plausible then than they are now. How many people really believe that higher education is going to be successful for all Americans these days? That's where these people come from, and nobody saw coming that the children of this comfortable prosperity, who are supposedly in some sense the future, are going to turn savage. They're going to react to music in the way you expect tribesmen to have reacted 10,000 years ago. But they did. It's really happening. It's all happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that... That's because it speaks to something true in the human heart. Music speaks to a longing for freedom in our souls, and as Plato famously put it, music speaks to the souls that long for God. This isn't simply reducible to rock gods, nor is it simply reducible to a studio, industry, corporate controlled way of suckering people into giving you their money that the repetitive, simplistic melodies of rock keep promising, 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 it's good, it's gonna be great, something's gonna happen, but then it doesn't happen, so you listen to it again, or you listen to the next song, or you find a new band, and so you keep paying them to make up for your disappointments. It's not reducible to all these criticisms, although they have a lot of truth to them. People have to figure out what are they going to do with their lives, or what really speaks to your heart, if you're not living in poverty or fear. What right. speaks to your heart? What is choice worthy? And it turns out that with youth, you get a revelation that we're not ready for. That what is choice worthy is that which you do not choose, but which chooses you instead. Right. Nobody chooses his way into becoming a rock fan, into any level of devotion. We see again with the young writer who, because of his mother, doesn't want to get involved in sex and drugs. He loves rock and roll. He doesn't want to become part of the movable feast of the orgy that's supposed to transform society. But he does believe in the music. We also see that with Penny Lane, who seems to be so cool and self-possessed and in control, so far above everybody else in her beauty. She can't help herself, she's in love with Russell. She's gotta leave him, she's gotta go away because he was married, is going with his ex-wife as a girlfriend. There's your sexual revolution. But he won't leave her, even though here it is, beauty incarnate. Everything you ever heard about in any rock song that made your heart thrum, he's got it in the palm of his hand. And she loves him to bits. She thinks that her beauty is there to make his life better. Mm -hmm. yeah, she's a independent woman, no feminism in her. But she didn't choose him. She says, well, you have to choose and improve a band as if it's a kind of scientific project. But she didn't choose him and she can't say no and she can't go away and she pretends her heart isn't breaking and she isn't being humiliated, but she ends up overdosing because she's had enough of this indignity. 
No, I think you're very right. There's something mysterious about her character. We see from certain signs that she's as intelligent or more intelligent as anyone on the scene. The William Miller character at one point says, I can't keep up with you. Yeah, she thinks she could control Eros, but she can't. So the sex-love confusion bites her big time. And the only solution is to just totally abandon Rock and find a whole new scene. She goes off to Morocco by the end of the movie, and she has this nice gesture where she arranges a reconciliation between Russell, the guitarist, and William Miller. But she's a problematic character, and part of the, as you said, the magic of the film, the picture of beauty or love in the film revolves around her. I want to just say a little bit more about the fame theme, though. We're talking about the suburbanness of the background, a lot of the characters. If we want to speak Tocquevillian, we would talk about the middle classness or the democratic social state that these people are embedded in. David Bowie has a song, it's not terribly well known, called Prettiest Star, where he sort of presents the idea that the rock star, the popular music star, is sort of the democratic road to heroism. A lot of the old roads to the heroic have been closed down. This is sort of the new path to being heroic. Uh, I would also refer to a great moment in the Doors film where Jim Morrison's clearly in decline, clearly losing control of everything, nonetheless confesses at one point the rock audience really wants is something spiritual. So these spiritual, heroic, poetic longings are really important to understanding rock generally and especially rock at this time. And that's why it's not just success worship. There's something that's expected from this fame and this achievement that's more. And I think you and I are in agreement that that promise isn't ultimately fulfilled. I mean, ultimately, any artistic endeavor, even if you look at classical music, has its limits of what it can do once you sort of understand some of the structure of it, some of the architecture of it. But rock was even more that way, because really what you're trying to do is fit big poetic statements, maybe classical music type statements into three minute songs or, you know, on an album, maybe a six minute song. There's ultimately limits to what you can really do. But again, in the early 70s, people are expecting a lot still from this rock music. But it's starting to go sour. There's sort of some questions about, well, maybe these corporations are sucking up all the activity. There's hints in this movie, obviously, with the Lester Bangs character of of how they're going to try to change things and rescue things with the punk movement. But I like the movie for the way in which I think it gets at the heart of rock music, which is this focus on fame and this focus on heroic expectation. I don't think you can really understand what happened with rock and why it might still remain significant for us if you don't look at those two things. And of course, their relation to the sexual revolution. All of this is happening in the environment of Eros. Finally, democracy has come to America. From the point of view of young Americans, they're the Democrats and adults are oligarchs. They are haves who live in fear of losing what they have. The young are have-nots who are acquisitive, greedy, energetic, trying to acquire something. Your mother tells you to stay in school, protect your chaste virginity, all these sorts of things that are fearful, defensive, protective, inhibitive. It's the voice of morality saying no whenever you want something. Mm -hmm. The young are going to be liberated from all that. They will say yes. Our protagonist has an older sister who bequeaths to him her love of rock music and who runs away from home to become a stewardess because that's freedom and flying. Yeah. You actually can fly in America. Yeah, there's a lovely moment in the film. One of my favorite moments is William is finally getting a chance to open up to Russell about his own family life. He talks about the domination of his mother. Her name is Elaine, played by Frances McDormand. And he says, and my sister, you know, left home to become a stewardess? This question mark. Her rebellion was was that? But there's also a connection with that rebellion, as mundane as it might seem, and Penny Lane. Penny Lane's big glamour scene at the riot house as she comes in and she pretends to be this French stewardess. I mean, again, Crows, this is autobiographical in many ways. I mean, we know, for example, that the Penny Lane character is based on some famous groupie who had Penny in her name. But Crow is making deliberate artistic choices here. I mean, he has to be thinking of the Beatles song and what it represents when he gives her that name. He has connected the mundane rebellion of William's sister as being becoming a stewardess to the glamorous rebellion of the Kate Hudson character. 
that's all very deliberate. Yeah. One content of freedom that you can immediately understand is don't tell me what to do. Now, this you could say is the American national motto, don't tread on me and the Gadsden flag. But in America, it becomes individualized. As we see, it's not just calling your political enemies Nazis in memory of the fact that Americans once stood against the Nazis for their national freedom. Everybody could call their parents Nazis or their boss because at an individual level, they also don't want to be told what to do. And that yeah. might just mean end up working for an airline corporation and be a stewardess. It's some kind of freedom. You're not tied right. to a place right. and you're flying. But you might well, be entering into another kind of obedience, which is indeed worrisome. So we see here that American freedom is ambiguous. And in relation right. to fame, it looks like this. Do you think that your raw God is above you or in front of you? Is he leading down a path that you can follow? Or is he living in another world where you can't follow? And of course, David Bowie, the protean God of rock music, is the best example of this. Is he really on Mars? Is he really in another world? Is he really Ziggy Stardust? Or is it that we can all be heroes? Is right. it that you can all be rebels and beautiful just the way you are? There are contradictions inherent in both versions. If David Bowie is a god above us, why does he need our worship to matter? He should be independent. But if he's just our leader, who can tell us that we're all beautiful, we could all be rebels, we could all be heroes, then why do we need him to keep telling us that? We should all be rock gods in that case. So these are inherent problems of democracy because at some level we're satisfied with democracy, don't tell me what to do, but at some level we want more out of life. Maybe you'd want to tell somebody else what to do or somebody to tell you that you matter to me, that you're more important than just another number, just another interchangeable person. These things play out in these young people's lives in a very confused way, but all of them are earnest. As you said, this is rock before irony, but moreover, it's people whose love is fairly genuine. Of course, you can't stop thinking. These people are all, without realizing it, trying to play Othello and end up saying, say about me, I love not wisely, but all too well. <laughs> really? You can't but be somewhat skeptical about this, but it is the case that they go into catastrophe if that's what's coming, or they go into disappointment without mercenary instincts. This is why the one enemy they can seize on is the corporations who are turning rock into a product, and those corporations are evil because the corporations are calculated, whereas the rock musicians are not. They may be immoral, somewhat bestial, but they cannot be accused primarily of mercenary reasons up until they in their fame face the limits of their own achievement and the movie makes a big big effort of showing you that on the one hand the band can't stay together because these people cannot be loyal to each other much less their fans but also they are tempted by their limits and their mortality jimmy fallon shows up he plays a really corrupt really slick really knowledgeable producer yeah he is the man who gives you hope then his hope he is and what is the hope? Well, he starts his audition with the band by respectfully and I like your music and your hot stuff. And he ends by saying, it's a matter of money. And you know what? I'm not even sure I want to work for you people. Ah, I'll try and see. He takes control over these people's souls because he's the one who can make things happen. You want to be Mr. Rock Music? Like our lovely groupies, you want to say, it's all happening. Somebody's going to make it happen. That takes a lot of organizational skill, and we see throughout the movie that everybody sucks at this. The band is not very good at organization, that all sorts of people who organize stuff for you are major league assholes, and they might get you killed because there's an ungrounded mic, and when our guitar hero puts his hand on the mic to really tell the people how much he loves them, shocks the daylights out of him, and happily he escapes alive. There's a lot of engineering work, a lot of logistics work, a lot of being practical and all-American know-how. But that's right. your father, not your rock hero. And that's the producer who tells you, your fame doesn't last. There was another guy who was famous before and another one who will be famous afterwards. What are you going to do? There's all that money out there. Are you going to grab it? Or are you going to let it go away? What do you want to end up as? Well, it's, it's not even so much what do you want to end up as, but it's just you're in this moment right? You've got a chance to take some loot. The moment is fleeting and you need to be organized to capitalize on it. You're a rising star, but you've got to act now. So again, like The Doors is the movie about the rock Dionysian expectation about the sexual hedonistic revolution. 
This is a movie about the regularization of hedonism and how that's going to happen. It has its limits. I mean, let's say maybe a little bit about the way Crow wraps up the film. Crow gives us a happy ending overall. The part that feels to me the most touching and believable is what happens with Penny Lane, Russell, and our hero, William. She does not turn to William as a love interest, even though he clearly loves her, um, and she has a great deal of respect for him. She escapes to Morocco. She arranges it so that Russell and William will have some reconciliation. That's a happy ending that I think naturally grows out of the characters. But the other thing that Crow does is we sort of get Stillwater redeemed. Stillwater goes back on the road in the bus as opposed to the plane, and somehow they've resolved the tensions between Russell's ego and the band's averageness. To Cameron's credit, he's shown us the OD slash suicide attempt of Penny Lane. And again, we're not led to believe that Stillwater music is all that great. I mean, without the groupies, without the drugs, without the crowds, it's pretty limited. So the happy ending, I think there's something of a problem there. I don't know if there's any way of a, a scriptwriter getting around it. But to me, the ending feels a bit complacent and sentimental. We end with this collage of Polaroid photographs of the band members and Kate Hudson's Benny Lane. And it's very beautiful. There's a beautiful song by the Beach Boys playing in the background. So it's all nice memories, but it's not clear that really anyone has truly advanced to a greater level of understanding. Maybe the William Miller character, maybe his mother, but we don't hold much hope for Stillwater. And you can't be that hopeful for most of the groupies. Yeah, um, it's strangely realistic at this level in a way that doesn't work well with the movie itself. Stillwater becomes a band that embraces in advance of the fact what we now call classic rock. Just think about that disappointment. It's like political people who are sort of conservative, sort of libertarian, who call themselves classical liberals. What they mean to say is, we're an infinitesimal minority and we will never matter. But back in history once, back in history once, songs <laughs> with rock music. Rock music was revolutionary. Now right. it's classic rock. It's the classic rock stations. You know what the more realistic name for it is? Dad music. <laughs> and next to that jokes that's not a thing Americans respect very much and at some point you have to make your peace with that and that's supposedly what Stillwater does you're gonna be touring there will be fans there'll have been the good times you'll have some fame mm -hmm. but you're never gonna make it whatever you thought was gonna be when you shoot up into the stratosphere you go by plane it's not gonna happen you have to redefine what it means that it's all happening being right. chastised somehow be grounded more and accept some of the nomadic, barbaric aspect of this life, what are you gonna do? That's somehow unfitting to the movie, but unusually realistic as a happy end. The other parts, Penny Lane flies off to Morocco, mm -hmm. she takes the women out of the story. At the end of the story, we have two things we have learned about women in America. One of them is that if you want to be Penny Lane, if you have this sort of ambition for female nobility in relation to the beautiful, you had better disappear into exoticism. Hmm. If you think glamour is going to work, you're suicidal. That ends up with ODs and whatnot. But then before that, we're also shown this scene with our star musician, rock god in Becoming, played by Billy Crudup, and another super groupie, Polexia Aphrodisia. <laughs> or maybe it's Sapphire, one of the two girls with the extraordinarily exotic Greek names, is there to chastise both our frontman for behaving worse than a rake humiliating and abandoning Penny Lane and betraying this young man who worshipped him as a hero, our protagonist. That seems to chastise the man and he goes and does right in as much as possible, which is not that much, but we'll get to it. But it also brings up this criticism of modern American women. You have this super groupie complaining that there are all these young women acting like whores. Now that is an amazing scene. It's really, really hilarious. And it also shows something somewhat realistic. Her two complaints are, these girls don't care about the music. They're just here for mm -hmm. sex and in their case without contraception. And they eat all the good catering food. That is to say, whatever rock music was and was supposed to have been, it has decayed into materialism and irresponsibility. 
Now, if you think contraception is more or less the height of sexual responsibility, you might have it wrong. But this woman is apparently confronted with something that's significantly more irresponsible. So it's pretty jaw-dropping. <laughs> And Cameron Crowe just plays it straight, and then you have, as you mentioned, our young protagonist, exhausted, returned home, disappointed, feels betrayed, and the failure. His big story was gonna be the cover writer for Rolling Stone. He was gonna tell a true story from the heart, that's also a story you don't hear a lot in America. He was gonna make it big. He was gonna be the next Lester Bangs, at 15 or 16. And then the band betrayed him and the magazine abandoned him and it turns out, no, you can't tell the truth because glamour, self-importance, vanity, the ugly side of fame just matters too much. Nevertheless, in a private, not a public sense, this rock god comes to him and levels with him and accepts the equality inherent in asking questions and getting answers. Just level with him. Yeah, well, I mean, Russell, when he shows up at William's house, he thinks that's Penny Lane's house. Penny Lane has tricked him into facing William one last time. She hopes correctly for a reconciliation. But maybe the most unrealistic thing about the happy ending is that Stillwater apparently reverses their stance, I guess under Russell's leadership, and allows the original Rolling Stone story to come out. So it's all happy. The band got raked over the coals by William. They, they were made to look like the selfish jerks they often were. Somehow they've allowed that learning experience to chasten them, and they're down to earth, they're humble. But I think there's some artistic failure, too much sentimentality. And well, yes, but it's of a specific kind. The right. quality of the resolution is that Eros has disappeared from the picture. Right. At the end, you have male friendship, and the woman is going to another continent. Right. You know that Penny Lane hasn't changed. She doesn't just order her ticket for Morocco, finally fulfilling her fantasy of a kind of lonely freedom where she's not exploited anymore. She can be herself without being defined by her famous friends who use her sexually. But she takes her sunglasses with her too. She will still be Penny Lane hiding. But right. instead, you get this male friendship, the young man and his rock hero are going to have to level as men, and they're going to have to deal with something else. If you take the eroticism out of rock music, what is left? There's a lot of spiritedness in rock music. There's a lot of anger for every Robert Plant soaring, erotic, orgasmic voice. There's a lot of anger in Jimmy Page's guitar. That is a driving, aggressive sound. Mm -hmm. And it seems that there's a shift there. And it's not at all clear, is the boy going to be a successful writer after all? You don't really know what he's going to do. But he has achieved something by way of self-respect, both by loneliness. He had to be a man in as much as he wanted to tell the truth. And it turned out very, very badly for him. And yeah. he had to deal with that defeat, learn a lesson there somehow, and at any rate, just have the endurance and the fortitude to deal with everybody who was supposed to propel you to fame, looking at you with disappointment and contempt and throwing you out. That's yeah. a manly thing. And then you have this man here who's a rock god, but lowers himself to being an American young man. Not the smartest of them all, and certainly not changed really, but somewhat chastened willing finally to tell the truth, no longer hiding behind success, trying to wow the writer to get a puff piece out of him. And that's about friendship. Your friends will tell you the ugly truth about yourself and you'll have to take it because you don't want to break with them. And at some level, you might know that you're not the greatest thing since bread came sliced. You could stand to be taken down a peg or two. And at the same time, of course, it is done with a certain kind of love. Your friends have your interests at heart, and apparently Russell is willing to deal with that. You're right that he has to be suckered into it to an extent. He thinks he's going to find this woman and she's the love of his life and they're going to have something romantic, which is all a complete lie that he still believes. But that has little to do with him accepting the ugly truth about himself being printed in Rolling Stone magazine. He was suckered into going to talk to the boy, not into doing right by him publicly. So there is a bit of honesty in right. No, that's right. A, a bit of manhood that says, well, you know, you're going to have to face the music. Yeah. And I say this more in one of my essays, but maybe the sour note with that is that there's really no way. I mean, Russell has learned his lesson. It's not so clear to what extent the other band members have learned the lessons. But the problem is for the band's continued artistry. 
I mean, what does Stillwater now mean if this is a band that's kind of saying, well, we're, the female, the beautiful is now absent? I guess my point is that the groupies were the most exciting thing about Stillwater and their music. And so there's not much way for them to apply their lessons that they're learning as they grow up. So Crow, on one hand, wants to say this is this learning experience for everyone, but it's not a learning experience that you can really embody in the artistry. Rock, especially hard rock, is to some extent a dead end. You have to keep pretending that you're part of this big party that's going on, and it's just ultimately not a sustainable stance. It leads to deadened artistry. I think you're I think perfectly right important. about this. Think about the power of rock music in two terms. One of them is negative, the other one is positive. To some extent, it's supposed to free you from restraints. And this was already there in the personal political protest of Eddie Cochran and Summertime Blues. Right. And that seems to have been universalized. Everybody now complains about how the system treats him and some kind of protest music that seems to have originated with rock has been individualized. And in whatever way you do it, in whatever way your group or chosen identity does it, at some level you have to complain that the system is not doing right by you and your individuality emerges in this complaint. Right. I'm whatever I am, I'm better than being treated this way. But then, of course, there is this other matter. The groupies really were the best part. There was a suggestion that production in the element of the erotic was going to lead to something new, that there was going to be something procreative, productive about rock music in American society. That is what failed. The other part really is sterile. Production in the element of the beautiful in the sense of poetry, it's to some extent a sham. But it seems to be necessary for two reasons. One of them is no more than the kids who grew up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s are people today satisfied with the way things are. Whatever it is that Americans do to raise their kids, and things have changed over the last two generations in significant ways, the kids are unsatisfied. In some way, they are rebelling. Although, of course, there's not a lot of similarity between running off to California from your suburban home and jumping into digital computer games and becoming a ghost. But both of them are saying by practice, America isn't good enough. Now, this may be something you like, this may be something you don't like, you might blame the liberals or the conservatives. However way you deal with this, the facts are there. People don't think America is good enough. In fact, in as much as they believe in America, they want more. And this dissatisfaction still gets a certain expression in music. It keeps for people alive a certain sense that there's got to be more to freedom than this. That this is not enough. Mm -hmm. But of course, in various ways, since the late 60s, early 70s, this has been privatized. The idea that vast numbers of people in arenas are going to somehow lead to a transformation in society has collapsed. But maybe you and your friends, maybe your nostalgia for what it was like when you were 16 or 20, some of these things might last and be worthwhile at the personal level or at the level of friendship perhaps. And it certainly is the case that it creates a sense of property so that people don't ever abandon the music of their teenage, high school or college years. They will stick with it for the rest of their lives and as we see those bands will be like zombies resurrected to keep doing it 50 years later when it has become in its social sense meaningless. It is sterile, but it still has this negative capacity to tell people there's got to be more than this to freedom. This is not good enough. But there's also something positive to this because something within the limits of popular music in the three minute song speaks to people about the beautiful. The suggestion here seems to be that people are obsessed with the erotic when the beautiful isn't that erotic actually. It's not hot babes as much as you might think. It might be a melody that touched you, that might be more important to you in the long run. And of course this in a sense means just settle down into middle class life. You think that you're in high school or college and your life is somehow transformed by certain experiences in your soul and this somehow is super erotic, but it's not gonna last. But you're gonna mm -hmm. remember this guitar solo for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard to get too down on people seeking out things like rock music. I mean, and I grant, of course, that there's other popular music versions of this. 
because it's a possibility that's there for you to impact your peers. These days, it's most likely going to be something small time, but it's something you can throw together with a limited amount of people. It's not as tough as something like composing a symphony or organizing a big band to put on a dance or something like that. Rock is a small time, middle class thing that you can pull off and you might be able to do something. My word for it now is that a lot of the forms are recyclements. You show your creativity by combining pre-existing elements in a new way. There's no reason to think that you're actually going to be able to create something new. If you really want to do that, you should look more at classical or jazz, or you might look at, say, artificial intelligence composition methods. But for something new, certainly rock is not anymore the place where you're going to find it. So my critique of the sentimentalism, part of the reason this movie will last is that I think it touches a lot of us in a soft spot for well, wanting to join Stillwater or something like that on the road. I think we can relate to the Kate Hudson and Pat Fugit characters. We want to be in the place where it's all happening culturally, intellectually, erotically, in terms of music. That nostalgic element of the film is powerful, and it's why people will uh, return to it. As Crow says in one of his commentaries on the film, it's connected to this bottom line love of the beautiful in the music. Crow says at one point, I just kept seeing all these films where it was all about the sex and the drugs, the sex and the drugs. I was like, this was not true to the way these people constantly talked when I was there with them about the music. They were obsessed with the quality, the power, and the mystery of the music. So I think both those things are going to remain attractive, and I think that's why this film has future audiences for it. I think he's perfectly right about this, and it's what really lasts of this music. Nobody really cares about how revolutionary this was. There are people with certain antiquarian librarian attitudes who are going to tell you how this album or the next artist introduced something really revolutionary for the time. Yeah. But that phrase, revolutionary for the time, really again is classical rock. Yeah. But that's not what really matters if you look back to it. The only thing that's left is, to some extent, it's beautiful. And you can find something there that is both pleasant and insightful. That is underrated, partly because rock music is young people music. And young people are not about craft, but they are incontrollably erotic in this sense. On the other hand, we don't have a good language for the beautiful. People can tell you technically what musicians did what. Who was technically better at what than whom. But there's not a very good language to describe and no way publicly to talk about what's the worth here. Music is simply impossible to discuss, which has hurt it, because nobody's going to take your answer seriously if you don't like what they like. But if you like what they like, what's the point of getting very specific or inquisitive? Yeah, you can say, paradox. oh my god, this is great. Oh no, that is great. Oh, they're all great. Or maybe none of them are. But it is very, very difficult to be reasonable about this. And this gets at something. It's not a surprise that Crow would understand this, since he's a poet himself, if in the medium of film. There is a massive separation between the poets and their audience that ultimately seems to doom rock. The claim of sameness, that within fame, the band and their audience are collected in a new form of community that involves a certain instantaneous communication by authenticity, by sincerity, that will short-circuit the distinction between people with poetic talent and people without. This is ludicrous and has been proven to be so. But it doesn't mean there was no talent there or nothing worthwhile. It just means that people were there while it was fun and when it stopped being fun, they stopped doing it. There's no way for the poets to last. And that's a big problem and I think makes a very good case for the more sentimental part of Cameron Crowe's nostalgia. That at least you can depend on because nostalgia to some extent is love of one's own. Mm -hmm. People will still hold on to this. And I would also just say that there remains something to do with pop music. I mean, I think this film, I've talked about its relation to The Doors. I think it can be very well compared to a superior film, Whit Stillman's The Last Days of Disco. And in that film, the emphasis is on 
the dance in a different type of aristocratic experience, one that's more collective. It's still limited. You have to get into the club and show some kind of excellence to get in. But once you're in, it's not there's not going to be this weird distinction between the rock god star and you and all the weird relationships that go between the star and the fan. People are always going to need to dance and to celebrate. There are more artistic and effective ways of doing that. And we in America are the inheritors of a very amazing Afro-American dance music tradition that plays out in different genres. And there's, you know, as a young person, you can do your peers some good by giving them a party that is civilized and a dance that brings young people together outside their cell phones or whatever. So it sounds maybe like a simple thing or a mundane thing, but it's still something that can be done. I would also just say that poetry remains poetry. Some of these songs, I mean, you've called them dad music, but some of these songs, a new musician can learn them, they can reproduce them, they can be passed down in that old organic way from one songwriter to another songwriter. Of course, the internet, we have everything recorded and archived, so you can pass it down that way. So there remains life in these natural human artistic endeavors. And I don't want to leave this thinking, well, Titus and Carl just think rock is dead. There's nothing left to do there. I do think in the future, some of the artistic frontiers are going to be more back in the area of the fine arts and, and maybe you know certain kind of things within cinema. But I think it's worth trying to understand what happened in the rock moment what was positive there, what was an illusion. <laughs> and that's, again, part of what my rock songbook was trying to do. Talk about certain songs that remain symbolic for us, that remain important to us, and try to see why some of those are, are landmarks to the failure of certain ideologies, particularly ideologies connected to the sexual revolution. Nonetheless, there's a reason why they appeal to us. There's a reason why we will return to some of those songs, at least. And they help us think about what our options are going forward as we get rid of the progressivist illusion that dominated the 20th century and the 21st century and beyond. Artistically, it's a matter of trying to select things from the arts that are good for us, useful for us, without this grandiose expectation of progress into an uncharted realm. So my songbook was an attempt to encourage that, just to apply what I thought I had learned from liberal education to what I knew about rock music. If you enter the words Carl's Rock Songbook into Google, um, you can explore around. I think you're going to link some of the essays that I did for Almost Famous. Yes, certainly. I think you're right about this, that the poetry still matters, and in certain ways it can still have a social effect, partly through dancing, partly because people need to listen to something and let it move them. Mm -hmm. This thing hasn't gone away. We have not shifted beyond what was discovered in the 60s, that there's a lot of lonely Americans or small groups of Americans who want to listen to something that speaks to them and they don't find it in other places. Yeah. It can't have the same power or the same influence, but it may be more serious with certain lowered expectations without this ideology of a quick solution. The 60s also show something else about America that is not fun. The willingness to question authority and to rebel against established ways goes hand in glove with a desperate desire to join cults and yeah. to sign up for being exploited. Yeah. And that, of course, is a terrible thing that has to be guarded against. But again, even that comes out of a certain deep awareness that things are changing far more than you realize, that America is in flux and that the whole world is moving who knows where. It's important to shed this delusion of progress that it will keep getting better. It's all happening. But... At the same time, some things are sometimes happening. Not all of the change is bad. A lot of the change is certainly fun and doesn't have bad consequences. And making people a bit more at home with the changes and trying to speak to them about what's happening with us. Why are we looking for identities by listening to ghostly voices in our ears? Mm -hmm. That's partly necessary. It's the mm -hmm. way we live now and it hasn't changed that much since the 60s and it won't go away anytime soon. Americans do not today have a very stable, solid identity with a clear view of the future. There's more of a willingness to say, oh my God, what a crisis, than, ah, it's fine. 
And yeah. so long as there is dissatisfaction with how things are going, a certain desire to figure out what our experiences mean, how are we going to deal with who we are, will endure. And it's a good thing. The answers are not going to be another ideology. They're not going to be a new way of revolutionizing technology so that people don't have to be human anymore. For all their faults, the rock musicians did have insights and part of the touch of greatness in your own rock songbook is showing that a lot of these people were sometimes skeptical of the revolution they were promoting and going through. That they could see it's not all going to be so good. That sometimes when they were crafting their art with a view to persuading people, yeah, it's all going to be perfect, they were lying through their teeth. It's a complex phenomenon that still hangs with us today because we're still in a situation where we have to wonder what the hell is the character of the change. Clearly it's not progress. Some part of it is progress, some part of it is not. What is happening with us and how can we explore our experiences in a persuasive way in the element of the beautiful? Mm -hmm. This is partly an escape from a scientific materialism, partly an escape from a public moralism that enshrines sameness, but at the same time always encourages people to look for their own advantage and to make it out of sameness. And yeah, I mean, you, you and I, and music is more honest. You and I both believe that the poetic artist, what he or she is up to remains very important for thinking about our future and for what will happen in our future. Yeah, in a certain sense, it will be crucial that there are some people who think you can glean insight from our experiences and you can deal with how we're doing. Yeah. It's not going to be solved, it's not going to be perfect, but it will work out for something better. Trust the beauty of the music and pay attention to what, what your mood tells you. Carl, thanks for joining me. I hope to have persuaded people to give the movie a chance or watch it again for people who do know it. And of course, to delve into your wonderful rock songbook about which we will do another episode in our Middle Brow series another time. And indeed, perhaps talk about The Doors, the wonderful Oliver Stone movie. Thanks a lot for joining me and let's do this again. Thank you so much, Titus. All the best. Mm -hmm.